My name is Paul May. I'm uh, from Dublin in Ireland, and I'm a student at the Interactive Telecommunications Program here at NYU. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is data representation and the kind of quest for personal meaning. Um, so the, I'm going to use two words in this talk an awful lot. And one is data and one is representation. Uh, so what I mean by data is structured information about our world, personal information, information given by governments. And what I mean by representation uh, is taking that information and mapping it into a different form, creating a graphic out of it, uh, creating an animation out of it, creating a sculpture out of it. Uh, and what I really want to do is continue a conversation that we're having at ITP about the way that this type of information is gathered, analyzed, and then mapped into these different forms. Uh, and we think it's a timely conversation because you open a newspaper today and you see this kind of slickly produced infographic. Uh, you open a magazine and you see these kind of very highly slickly produced uh, graphics and charts. Uh, even kind of TV news and sport has become this mashup of live footage and also data drawn from lots of these different sources. Um, so we think it's important that we look at these things and, and figure out how they influence our perception of the world. Um, so being from Dublin and being from Ireland, I, I, I kind of took an opportunity that a lot of people take, writers and artists and, and designers when they leave a country, is to look back on the place where they're from and see what they can learn about their homeland. Uh, and as you're probably aware, Ireland is going through somewhat of a, a kind of a political and a social crisis at the moment, uh, caused by uh, some bad financial decisions, shall we say. Um, so I, I wanted to take an opportunity to use data to see what I could learn about this time in our history. Um, so I set out to create this project, which is called Irish Data. Uh, and what I wanted to do was just figure out the kind of root cause of Ireland's financial crisis. But instead, I found a few different things. What I found was that the type of data that you would need to actually answer that question was incredibly difficult to find uh, and incredibly fragmented and in lots of awkward formats. Uh, so what I was forced to do was basically go to these different sources, aggregate that information into my own database, and create my own API of information. So instead of being able to go to a government source to try and get this type of information, I had to basically create my own data source. Uh, and what I discovered was not just that uh, I could create this type of resource, but that things were far worse than I had imagined. Um, so this is the live register or the level of unemployment on the month that I was born in, in November 1980. And this is November of 2010. Uh, and so the process of actually going through this data kind of led to kind of a lot of personal meaning for me. The second project I did in this vein uh, was called From Over Here. And again, I wanted to look back on Ireland. I wanted to kind of figure out through data uh, the way that Ireland was perceived uh, outside the place where I was born. Um, we have this kind of folk idea of ourselves in Ireland, as I'm sure everybody does in every different country. And I wanted just to examine the extent to which that that uh, perception was, was real. Uh, and I think the perception that Irish people have of the way that they are perceived is that they're kind of affable, uh, fun-loving, uh, and all the rest of the cliches that you find. Uh, but there's another kind of folk idea that we have for ourselves that we're kind of well-educated, uh, English-speaking, especially when you talk about employment in Ireland. The things that are said is that we're kind of well-educated, whatever. Um, and you would think that there would be some evidence for this in the world's largest English language newspaper, the New York Times. Uh, so what I wanted to do was use the Times Open API uh, to pull information about Ireland uh, uh, mentioned in articles and see what exactly the perception of Ireland was in this kind of, in this kind of source. Uh, what I found was that the, the perception of Ireland, in, at least in this text, is quite different from the per perception I would have had of, of the results I would have found. Uh, so far from the kind of positive image that we would have of ourselves, the kind of quiet man view of Ireland, uh, I find that the, the kind of coverage of Ireland is, is, is mostly centered around reasonably negative topics. Um, so again, like by engaging with these large data sets and by creating my own artifacts, I get a huge amount of personal meaning. So what other than the kind of momentary insights based upon these projects did I learn? Well, I learned that the technical barrier to actually engaging with big data and actually deriving personal meaning is incredibly low. Uh, I'm not a computer programmer, but in a short amount of time, I'm able to put together tools and systems that let me uh, dig into this data and really answer kind of personal questions. Uh, in the first project, I had to actually build my own data source. Uh, and that was actually, again, quite straightforward. Uh, and so what I really learned about this is that we are incredibly kind to governments and corporations when they don't give us our data in the formats that we want it, want it in or in the formats in which it's useful. It's an incredibly easy thing to do. Uh, and it reminds me that we're always in a position of weakness when we ask for things from people who are in power. Um, we're too kind. Um, so I can envision a world where 
let's say everybody in this room, we pool our, our data together as citizens and we release it to governments and we release it to corporations rather than asking it, for, for asking it uh, in return for, for a, tra a transaction. Um, so what if the census was something that we did together by pooling together anonymously our, our personal information and then releasing it to governments in, in, response, for in, the, in, uh, in response for something else in, in, uh, in the other direction? And we're far too kind about the release of our personal information and far too benign about uh, when it doesn't come back to us in the, in the right formats. The second thing I learned is that data is always messy. Uh, it's, it's created by humans, uh, and it rarely ever comes to you in these kind of neat little packages. It always has to be massaged or changed or reformatted or put into different types of packages. Uh, it's far from the kind of slick presentation that you see in, in, in animations uh, and graphics. It actually needs to be uh, treated as though it's kind of a raw material like a clay. Uh, and again, you get no sense of that when you see these kind of graphics and animations. It's seen as though data is this kind of cold and clinical thing. Uh, there's nothing as human as looking at a big data set and saying, well, this person didn't come to work on a particular day and they just forgot about a particular month. It becomes a very human activity when you're digging through data. The most important thing I learned, though, is that engaging with big data sets to derive personal meaning is about the process. It's about the process of going through many, many failed prototypes uh, and many, many kind of side tangents and different kind of routes to get to where you want to go. Uh, it's about the process of kind of cutting out the stuff that isn't important to get to the point where you really, really are interested. Uh, and, and this was really, really important for me that the, the focus at the moment is always about, you know, when we represent data, when we put it a, as a graphic or animation, is it an aesthetic product or is it a, a useful product? Is it, is it a kind of a piece of art or is it an infographic designed to tell us about unemployment? Uh, you know, and this to me feels like we're arguing over the shape of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it, it feels to me as though we're really just not grasping the point of the representation of data. Is that underneath the surface of these kind of slickly produced products is this very, very human process. Um, and we speak very, very little to that in the, in the things that we see on the TV or in newspapers. Um, so my proposal today is that uh, where we see an infographic in a, in a newspaper or in a magazine or on TV, and where there's no uh, insight into the way that that data was gathered or processed or treated before it came into this end format, that we treat it as a purely aesthetic composition, not as something that is useful for us to tell us about the world. Uh, because it's so easy to offer insight into these things. You just release your source code, you tell us about the method, uh, and you just give us you know, a, a paragraph as to how you treated the information that you used to create this graphic. Um, so rather than arguing about whether or not something is aesthetic, uh, I'd rather we were fostering a sense of insight into how these products are made. So why does this really matter? Um, it matters to me because when we interact with humans, say, in a social network, we're not actually interacting with them. We're interacting with their representations of themselves through data. We're interacting with the, the pieces of information that they've said that they would, they're okay giving out into the world. Um, data is also becoming the kind of subject of a huge amount of news stories. You know, it's not just something that's used to support a news story, it's actually the subject of news stories, WikiLeaks, these types of things. You know? And it's important that I think we have the, the, kind of the tools and the skills and the insights that we can personally grapple with this stuff and not just take what is given to us and, and assume that it's accurate. The most important thing, I think, about uh, data and data representation is that we, we create these very intimate diaries of ourselves <laughs> everywhere we go. Uh, we're constantly you know, touching into social networks, we're carrying around these devices. Uh, and the kind of privacy implications are obvious and they're, they're not really the things that I'm interested in because I think the privacy issues around data are actually quite simple. Uh, you just don't release the data or you release it in a secure format. It's not an interesting conversation. It, it's made feel more complicated by people who don't want to make data private. Uh, my concern about these things and, and my, uh, my interest is that when we come to reconstitute an idea of ourselves that's been fragmented across all of these different social networks, uh, that it's actually incredibly difficult to do. So we come to say, I want to get a better understanding of who I have been in the last decade. It's incredibly difficult for us to do that in the way that data is shared and represented at the moment. When we come to create a representation of ourselves, it's practically impossible based upon the way that data is given right now. And further, when you zoom out from that, when we come to try and get an understanding of other cultures and other people, it's very, very difficult. My worry is that we will reach for the things that are most accessible, the data that we you know, find comfortable about ourselves or the data that we find easily about other cultures, and not for the stuff that's actually accurate, not for the stuff that's difficult to get, but, and maybe painful, but accurate. So how do we continue this conversation? Well, the first thing I would, I would ask you to do is just figure out what, what you're passionate about, 
figure out what is most important to you in the world. And I guarantee you there is relevant, accessible data out there for anybody. If you have Excel, if you have a text editor, if you have anything, if you have a, a computer of any kind, if you have a pen and paper, you could do this. And figure out what type of data is out there that informs you about these passions. And go and try and get it. When you try and get it, you will probably end up interacting with some sort of power structure. You'll probably figure out that there are people who have this data and who don't want to give it to you or don't want to give it to you in a particular format. What I would say is then go and collect your own data. Go and try and make your own representations of the world based upon your own information. People like Nicholas Felton are really, really good at doing this. When you get this data, ask yourself what type of question do I answer, want to answer first? So for me in Ireland, it was like, well, how bad are things and, and how are we perceived from abroad? Very simple questions, but ones that have a huge amount of meaning for me. And try and create a representation of that information that leads to personal insight for you. And again, it's a prototyping iterative process. It's something that you will go through and throw away 99% of the stuff that you create. Um, and then finally, when you, when you go out and you encounter these representations of data in the world, just because they have the smell of science and order about them, don't, don't think for a second that they are in fact orderly and scientific. They are human products that are based upon imperfect processes. Um, so when you see these things, even if they're scrolling across the bottom of your TV, uh, I, would think that, I would hope that by doing these things, by looking into data, even in a trivial way, you start to become more critical about the things that you see around you. Um, so I think this is a really important conversation to have. Um, so much of our world is based around data, and hopefully by uh, working around some of these ideas, uh, we can live in a world of data uh, and be informed at the same time. Thank you very much.